the past, we don't let this go to your head. He said, but there's just, we're trying to compare everything to the well. And I said, yeah, I understand. So, you know, well, people, you've got a good church, great church. you got great people. you got great leaders. you got a great youth pastor. you got a great pastor. <laughs> but it ain't about us. It's all about him. Right? And it's all about recognizing who he is and what he has for us. God's been so good to us. He's blessed us as a church. But he's blessed us because I truly believe that God's people have come together and they've made it about him and his world. Nothing more, nothing less. Right? All about him. All right. We're in Romans today. Uh, for you that have hung in here during all this series, it's all going to come to a culmination today, people, because we're in the last chapter. We're in the last message of Romans. Now, don't think for a minute we're not going to talk about Romans, you know, for a while. It's such an important book. There's so many great passages of Scripture, truth that are in there. So uh, we'll always somewhat be in Romans. But uh, 37 messages... Over 22 hours of teaching, and we haven't scratched the surface of Romans, all right? Romans in the very first, and I'm not going to do a big recap or anything, but it starts off in Romans 1, and it basically tells us this. Just listen. He, being Jesus, was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it tells us the good news is about his son. Romans opens up with that. Paul opens the letter to the early church with that bold statement. And he's going to be bold in how he ends this thing too, all right? It's going to take a few minutes to build this, so hang here with me. The first half of the message is not where we're even going, all right? I just always put that out there for you because if anybody wants to fall asleep, you're going to miss it, all right? Romans chapter 16, verse 17. We'll start there. Again, this last chapter, last few, last few words of Paul to the early church there in Rome. says, And now I make one more appeal. My dear brothers and sisters, watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. Now, if you were here last week, we talked about the source of hope. We talked about, uh, and we saw in the verse, it's uh, Romans 15, 4, that how uh, things were written from Scripture long ago to teach us. And the Bible says there in Romans that the Scripture gives us hope and encouragement. Uh, we have a source of hope that fills us completely with joy and peace when we trust in him. So if you're struggling with joy and peace, be encouraged by his word and trust him. That's how you get that joy and peace. If you try and find it or fill it with anything else, it's never going to fill it's never going to be filled. That's why the whole world, it doesn't matter how much money they have. It can be a, a king with all the money in the world. It could be a star in Hollywood. It could be whomever. There's always going to be a void without the source of hope. And it's constantly going to be filling that void. And if it's not filled with his word and the joy and peace that comes from him by trusting in him, it'll always be empty. Always be empty. Paul's last words here in this letter, early church, he warned about listening to anything other than God's word. Look at verse 17, there again, Romans 16, 17. Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. You all should know by now, not everyone claiming to speak the truth is telling you the truth, Right? I know you heard it on Facebook. You watched a TikTok video. Doesn't make it true, right? They may claim to be of God, sent from God, be of God, but they're motivated by their own selfish reasons, not empowered by God. And what they say always creates chaos, confusion, and division. 
If you're not hearing the truth, it will always create chaos, confusion, and division. All right? How do you know that what you're hearing is the truth? It's a valid question. I'm going to give you three things here. I'm going to rattle them off here pretty quick. Again, this is just kind of building on where we're going with this. Very first thing, very simple, it must align with God's word. If something you read or hear does not align with God's word, it cannot be God's word. It can't be. If something is taken from God's word and twisted, God does not twist his word. God's word is God's word as you read it. Just because sometimes you read something and you don't like it, that doesn't mean, well, that can't mean that. Because that doesn't feel good. <laughs> right? That's not how it works. <laughs> if what you hear or read does not acknowledge Jesus as Christ, it's untrue. Truth must always, always acknowledge that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. Always. If there's any variation, even the slightest from that, none of it then is true. None of it. And then the third thing, which it's just funny how, again, I didn't tell these guys what to say, <clears throat> none of that. But the third thing is truth must always give God glory. Must always give him glory. If what you read or hear doesn't give God glory, but brings glory to somebody else, it is not true. And I'll even go as far as say, and this isn't what my message is about, but listen, if it's some kind of ministry and it's glorifying man rather than Christ, don't write that check, people. <laughs> don't make that deposit or whatever. It's not of God if it doesn't bring glory to God. We're invited to give him praise, but we are never, ever to share his praise. Make sense? It's what we just read there in Isaiah. We give him praise, we never share his praise. Paul warns, if someone writes, declares anything contrary to these things, then stay away from them. Stay away. Nothing good can happen. Stay away from dividers and deniers. They're not true seekers. They're not true speakers. They're deceivers, either willingly or they've been caught up into the deception themselves, right? 2 Timothy 4.3, look up on the screen. This verse will be up here. This is written, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. That's the world you and I live in. That's the world you and I live in. When I was a kid, I would hear preachers preach about this, and i got to be honest, it didn't connect with me. Um, as I'm older now, and the world I live in and you live in, it connects a lot with me. <laughs> because our world just wants to hear what it wants to hear, right? Nobody wants a course correction. Nobody wants to be offended. Nor does anybody want to offend anyone, right? Well, that's, that's not how it works. God's Word, when you come to God's Word, it should always change the way you think, the way you behave, the way you feel, the way you respond. You cannot come to God's Word and leave unchanged. If you do, then you aren't actually coming to God's Word. You're either just reading some words, but it's going to cause change. The Bible says, we talked about last week, Proverbs 3, 5, 6, lean not on your own understanding. Listen, you are never to go to your own understanding. You're never to lean on it. Trust on it. Be pulled, swayed by your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. It goes on to tell us in, in 2 Timothy, again, it's not up here, but um, God's Word teaches us what's true and makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. <laughs> uh, Brother Brennan, I mean, I really appreciated what he shared because it's just the truth. 
Sometimes you're, you're marching along and everything's great and you, you read God's word looking for him to speak, right? And then when he speaks, it's like, oh, I didn't want you to say that. <laughs> that hurts. But then you come before him, you repent and say, okay, God, huh, you're trying to teach me. You're doing it because you love me. You want me to spend time with you, right? We are all that way. 2 John 1, 9 through 11. Just listen. I'm not sure I'll have these verses up here. Just listen. 2 John 1, 9, 11. <laughs> Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. It's talking about the teaching of Christ. Anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home or give any kind of encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people become a partner in their evil work. Now, some of you, you get that knock on the door. Somebody wants to talk to you about something, and they won't tell you what it is unless you let them in. <laughs> then when you let them in, you're like, oh. <laughs> or when they do, you're like, I'll show them. Now, the Bible says don't invite them in. How about that? Don't debate them. Don't invite them in. Send them on their way. Anytime you do, you become an encourager, a partaker. Now, I'm not just talking about people that, you know, want to proselyte you. But this involves anything, anything. Listen, stay away from dividers, deceivers, and deniers. There's no truth. There's no truth. They're not from God, of God, for God. If the truth of Christ is not proclaimed, stay away. All right, most of you, I don't see anybody asleep. You did pretty good. We're going to transition. All building. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans 16, verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis, what Satan deceived Eve. The, the Bible specifically says he deceived Eve. Adam went along with it. Whole other story. Satan denied, twisted God's word, and he still uses that tactic today. Satan's already fallen. His pride caused his fall. Satan has never surrendered his pride. He will never give up his pride. Satan will never give up his pride. He continues to boast while he divides, denies, and deceives. That's what Satan does. However, the God of peace, and he is the God of peace, you can't have peace without God. But the God of peace is at war with Satan. And you listen, you and I as believers, when we look at how much our world has run amok, we oftentimes, even as a believer, you just kind of feel deflated and defeated, don't you, by what's going on? It's like, my word, this isn't... This isn't the, the America of my childhood. This isn't whatever it is, you know, as if it was great then too, right? Let's be, we, we kind of are nostalgic about some things, but it's obviously much worse. We know that to be true. But we can think that the world is winning. People, the God of peace is at war with Satan and his demons and their work of evil. He's at war. The God of peace will win this whole thing by his word. The very thing Satan denies, divides, deceives. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. This is a, there's a cross reference here that God told the serpent Satan, if you remember the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Let me read it to you. So we got this in Romans 16, 20. I'm going back to Genesis 3, 15. Because again, got Old Testament. You know, I love people where, well, the Old Testament don't matter anymore. It matters. <laughs> uh, to God, it matters. Remember that chart a few weeks ago, the cross references? Come on. God, it matters. Anyway, Genesis 3, 15. I will cause hostility between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring, he, being Jesus, will strike your head 
and you will strike his, being Jesus, heel. What's that talking about? Listen, Satan would bruise Jesus' heel. When Satan deceived Eve and Adam went along with it and they sinned and they brought sin into the world and the Bible tells us that sin was passed right from Adam that all have become sin. No one is righteous. No, not one. Sin's been passed ever since that. Jesus Christ came, went to the cross, crucified, died, buried. His heel, because of sin in the world, was bruised. But then we'll celebrate later this month, three days later, he resurrected and Satan's head was crushed. Right? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. Look at these verses. Let's just that verse about crushing his head. Let's see how it plays out. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and looked locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. So there's coming a day, Satan's going to be bound, chained for a thousand years. This is talking about the millennial reign, thousand year reign. Christ is going to come back to the earth physically, second coming, all right? And there's going to be a, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. You've got the rapture, the seven-year tribulation, then the millennial reign, all right? But there's going to be a battle called Armageddon. And in that battle, the Lord wins his battle by his word. It's going to, the Bible talks about it like a sharp sword that comes from his mouth. It kills the attacking, destroys the attacking army that come against him and all those that are with him. That's all in Revelation chapter 19. Again, <clears throat> It's not where we're going today, but if you're interested, read his word. He tells you what's going to happen, all right? Satan's bound for a, a thousand years. Jesus physically reigns on this earth. People will, during that thousand years, will literally go and be able to stand before Jesus. And you and I that are believers that were in this current age that was raptured out before the tribulation, Old Testament, New Testament saints, the Bible says you and I, as believers, will rule and reign with him. All right? During that time. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. That's you and I that are believers in this current age. For them, the second death holds no power. The second death is the permanent death. All right, that's the everlasting death versus everlasting life. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. So, you know, look, you don't even, the Bible's not even vague about it. There's going to be a thousand years. Christ is going to rule and reign. And those of you that are his, put your faith and trust in him, you will rule and reign with him. It, it's just plain and simple. Now, what gets a little strange is after the thousand years, Satan is let loose for a little while. Let's read about it. Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years comes to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog. In every corner of the earth, he will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people in the bluff city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is talking about the, God, the battle of Gog and Magog. It's going to be over before it even starts. Satan's going to be forever defeated. So when you and I read the verse, Romans 16, 20, when it says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, the God of peace is at war right now with Satan and his demons. All the evil work they're doing. When Christ went to the cross, he crushed Satan's head. And listen, with what's going to be, what's going to happen is that head's going to be cut off forever. All of eternity. 
Satan is defeated now. He's defeated. His destruction is going to come to fulfillment just as Scripture says. It's going to play out before you and I. He knows he's defeated. He knows his time is running out. He knows the end of the book, which is the end of him, is coming. And he wants to do anything and everything he can to take your soul to hell with him. Now, if he can't have your soul because you're a believer, because you put your faith in Christ, because you've been saved, what does saved mean? Saved means you won't perish. That's why the John 3, 16 verses, right? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If Satan can't have your soul, then the next best thing he can do is make you ineffective, right? He can't have you because the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you. You're off limits as far as being possessed by Satan. But you can be oppressed. And you and I as believers are oppressed every day. But, you know, it's, it's not just, I mean, we have our own problems with our own sin. We have our own problems with our own co-workers and jobs and finance, all those kinds of things. But, but understand there is an evil worker in the backdrop of it all. Satan wants to keep you from impacting others and advancing his kingdom. So if he can't have you, he wants to make sure that you don't cause him to not have anyone else. All right? Now we've already read what Paul's written about Satan using deceit, division, and denial. Another tool Satan uses, and this is really where we're going to park and rest for a few moments with the time we have left. Another tactic Satan uses is fear. Fear. It would probably surprise you how much fear is talked about in Scripture. If you, if just by simple looking up the word, if you use the KJV translation, if you just put in the word fear, it's 385 verses have the word fear in it. If you put in the word afraid, that's another 185 verses. And there's different ways of wording fear or afraid, and you can keep adding to the list. Now, not all fear in Scripture is bad, the fear of the Lord is good, right? Those are good things. But fear is talked about, talked about heavily because guess what God knew? You and I are going to struggle with fear. We're going to struggle with fear. Satan uses fear to weaken your faith. He uses fear to make you afraid. He uses fear to make you ineffective. He uses fear to cause you to doubt, make you question God's word, even deny God's word. Peter, why did he deny? He was afraid. Fear. Satan uses fear to create confusion, chaos. He uses fear to make you, make you anxious, anxiety, panic. He uses fear to torment you. He uses fear to, to uh, wear you down, exhaust you. You ever had times of fear where you're just worn out? Right? Satan uses fear to make you retreat from God's word and his promises. Satan will use fear to make you retreat from God's word, God's promises. Sometimes you're fine during the day, you're working, you're busy, everything's hectic, right? You're just, your mind's lost in the day's events, and then night creeps in. And Satan, a lot of times, uses night to attack and make you feel that loneliness and fear, right? When you and I operate out of fear, what you and I as a believer, I'm talking to believers today, what you and I have done is we've turned our fear over to faith. We've basically just taken everything of God and said, Satan, here you go. I know you're defeated, but I guess just use whatever it is against me. Okay? 
you've turned your faith over to fear. And so I, what I want to, again, spend a couple of moments on is the fact that you need to faith your fear. You need to faith your fear. And how do we do that? How do we faith our fear? We're going to get into that. I was driving the other day, listening to the radio station, Air One Plan, and the DJ came on, and he made this statement. He said, your fear is more afraid of your Jesus. And I love that. Your fear is more afraid of your Jesus. So we're going to take the word fear. We're going to create a little uh, acronym to help you remember this. We're going to take fear and we're going to turn it upside down. Look at this little thing up here. This is just something to kind of help you in this whole thing about fear. I want you to take the word fear, turn it upside down, and we're going to make fear rise above every fear. You and I rise above every fear. And then it's kind of, I know it's small print there, but this is what we're talking about. We're going to, R, we're going to run to the Father. We're going to read his promises. We're going to resist Satan's attacks. And we're going to rest in his perfect love. Amen. All right? That's how you're going to do this. And I want you to understand this isn't trying to just be a cute little thing. I want you to remember this. It's a tactic for you to use because there is a tactic being used against you by Satan, and that's fear. So we need to be just as clever, Scripture even tells us, <laughs> when it comes to Satan and his ways, right? Can you avoid fear? Probably unlikely. I hate to break it to you. It's kind of, fear kind of comes instant. But something happens and there's just, oh my word, you know. I mean, you look at the bank account, there was money yesterday, now there's not. Uh. <laughs> yeah, right? Stupid kids. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is, listen, you're not going to stop fear but how you respond to the fear, that's what the battle is. How you respond. How do I rise above every fear? How do I rise above every fear? First things, run to the Father. Run to the Father. The scripture says, Psalm 71, 1, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. You know what happens when fear strikes? You know what Satan's doing? He wants to create a wedge, a divide, a division between you and your God. The last thing he wants you to do is run to God. If that's the last thing Satan wants me to do, it ought to be the very first thing I do. Right? But be honest, is, is that immediately where you go when you experience fear? Probably not. We need to run to the Father. Don't retreat or run away. Run toward God, toward His world. That second R there, read, remember, remind yourself of His promises. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Listen, you will never know God's promises if you don't know God's promises. <laughs> you think it's important whether you're in God's Word or not? People's important. It's God's word. It's what he wants you to know about him. It's what he wants you to know about your situation. Listen, turn off the news and get into God's word. Get into God's word. Right? That's the truth. That's the reality of the situation is God's word. Another thing here is resist Satan's attacks. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Listen, I want you to understand, this isn't just a wishful verse. This is a commanding verse. God moved the writer to give you this verse that if you submit to God, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Satan does not have the realm of ability to continue to oppress you if you submit to God and resist him. He can't. There's the boundary of God's word. His head's been crushed. He's defeated. He cannot go beyond the limits of God's word. So I'm just telling you, this, is a, this isn't just a sound good verse. It's truth. Resist him. But that's our problem. We don't resist. We give into it. We cave to it. 
we take the God of where nothing is impossible and we, we create the world you and I live in, a, uh, it just, it's just not going to work out. It just can't. That's not the world your father has us living in, even in this world. He must flee when I resist. Run to Jesus. Read his word. And then rest. Rest in his perfect love. Rest in his perfect love. 1 John 4, 18. Listen, make a note of this verse. Okay, people. Just commit this thing to memory. This, this part of this verse here. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Listen, Jesus is perfect love. He is perfect love. He gives perfect love. He came in perfect love. He died on the cross in perfect love. He was buried in perfect love. He resurrected in perfect love. He ascended to heaven in perfect love. He will return in perfect love. We will rule and reign with him in his perfect love. He defeated Satan in perfect love. Perfect love casts out fear. They cannot coexist. You and I need to rest in his perfect love. And, you know, listen, I don't have a great illustration for this, but listen, when your parents or grandparents, when your kids, you know, your kids, they don't worry about a lot of stuff. You and I worry about, they just know, hey, I'm with dad, I'm with mom, my parents are with me, I don't need any money, they got it all. <laughs> I'm getting hungry, I know mom's got the fridge stock. When I come to visit, I know mom's going to start fixing, you know what I mean? They don't have all the worries, why? Because they rest in the care of you as a parent and as a grandparent. Why do you and I struggle with resting in the care of our father for us? Why? Again, this isn't just a feel-good verse. Perfect love casts out fear. When I don't go to God, get in his word, resist Satan, then listen, there's no way I'm going to rest in his love. And that fear, instead of being cast out, is going to hang around. It's going to hang around. Perfect love casts out all fear. Your fear is more afraid of your Jesus. you got to live it, trust it, run to it. You all know the verse, 1 John 4, 4, Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Greater is he that is in you. You, believer, have Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit in you. God's Word He's telling you, Greater is the Holy Spirit. Part of the Trinity. Greater is he that is in you than he that's running this world for now. But that ruler is going to be bound by chains for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. He's going to be defeated. He's going to be let loose. He'll be defeated again. And forever, 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 he'll be in a lake of fire. Defeated. Head cut off. Why don't we let him rule over us now? Why don't we let him have us run to a state of fear or stay in it? That's the key, isn't it? When fear comes, you don't have to stay in it. You don't have to settle in it. You don't have to rest in it. You don't have to wrestle with it. Give it to God. Go to God. Get this word. Let God's perfect love cast out the fear. It's his promise to you and I. Your fear is more afraid of your Jesus. 2 Timothy 1, 7. God's not given us a spirit of fear. All right, you all know this verse. I know you know this verse. Let's just park here just a second. We are, we're almost done. People. So close. God has not given us what? What's it say? Spirit of fear. So you do not have a spirit of fear that lives within you. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So you don't have a spirit of fear, so why do you live in a spirit of fear? Think about it. I, sometimes we just, you know, something happens, fear comes, and we just, we're just like, okay, you know. You, you get defeated right along with it. 
You do everything, I mean, everything that Satan wants, you fall right in for it. I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm not excluding me, okay? I'm in that same boat with you. We get right there and we let Satan. We don't have that spirit in us. God's not given to us. He's given us every reason and promise and word and everything to not live in it and rest in it and dwell in it. And yet you and I just decide, I'll just wallow all in it. Is that a Michigan word? That's a Missouri word for sure, wallow. <laughs> wallow all in it. Your fear is more afraid of you, Jesus. For God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of, what's that next word? But of power. I think the one that has all authority and all power, I mean, if I'm going to have power given to me, I want it from the one that has all power, right? <laughs> of power and of what? Love. It's that perfect love that casts out all fear. And of a what? Sound mind. Why is the world crazy, people? Because they're crazy. They don't have a sound mind. Then we, as believers, we shouldn't get all crazy with them. We've got a sound mind because it's from Him, right? Fear, panic, anxiety, all your fear is not from God. When we operate out of that, we're just letting Satan have his way. God's not turned us over to fear. He's not saved us to be tormented by fear. We're told numerous times throughout Scripture to not be afraid. Let me give you a couple more verses and we're going to close. Psalms 56, verse 3 and 4. But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. So notice what he says, when I am afraid. Are you going to be afraid? Yes. What do you do? Put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? Listen, when you are fearful, when you get afraid, when something happens, whatever it is, whether it's something of your own or you fell into it, you come to God's word. And there's no way you can come to God's word believing it, trusting it, and that fear remain. It is an impossibility. It can't happen. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Listen, when fear comes in the middle of the night or even during the day, the Bible tells us in Psalms 91, 5, listen to this verse. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. People, you need to flip the script on fear. You need to fake your fear. You need to rise above every fear. Run to the Father. Read his word. Read his promises. Resist Satan's attacks and rest in his perfect love that casts out all fear. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. And I'll remind you of Jesus' words, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Look, I don't know, uh, I wasn't even going to preach Romans 16. We were going to just wrap Romans 16 up with, last week was going to be the last one. That's what I had planned and prepared. And then God got me up last, uh, well, it might have been a couple of Sundays ago at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and it was just kind of a simple, you're not going to let my word go, Mr. Clayton Beck. <laughs> I've got something I want to say. And I sat there and just began reading this word. And God just was giving me all this about fear. You and I will experience times of fear and being afraid. But we need to recognize it for what it is. It's an attack. It's not from God. And listen, we need to respond. Right? Respond. Run to God. Read his word. Know his word. Know his promises. Resist Satan's attacks. And rest in his perfect love that casts out all 
fear. Fathers, we come before you. God, I don't know what anyone here, dear God, may be struggling with. You obviously wanted this preached. God, I pray whatever it is you wanted said to whomever it is here that needed to hear that God, it was heard. God, I pray you would help all of us, all of us, dear God, rise above every fear, run to you, run to you, dear God, run to you, run to your word, resist Satan's attacks, dear God, and God, just rest in your love. Help us to respond the way we should when fear happens, when fear takes hold, when Satan tries, dear God, to defeat us and deflate us and exhaust us and cause us to be ineffective, dear God. He has been crushed. He has been defeated and he should have no reign in me. I have your spirit in me with all power and authority that comes from you. Love that's from you, a sound mind, knowing your word that's from you. God help me to respond the next time fear attacks. Let me trust you. Let me trust you. Fathers, we come before you. I thank you, dear God, for these people. God, I thank you for your word. God, I pray your word would just strengthen, encourage, dear God, speak to God, not just be something they sat through here but that, God, they meet with you, that it comes from you, because it's your word. Let it not be a message that leaves us so quickly, dear God, that, God, one, we chew on, and we go back and read your word, dear God, and, God, just make it personal to ourselves of how much you love us and what you want for us. And, God, we as yours should never, ever, let Satan have a foot. We are victorious in you. Remind us of it, dear God. Let us not live in fear. But God, teach us, help us to faith our fears by running to you, reading your word, resisting Satan, and resting in your perfect love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. All right. Well, again, I encourage you to go in, read those verses yourself. You can get the notes again through the YouVersion Bible app.